I hate to say yes, but in a, in a sense, I think it is. I think women are, are very used to working collaboratively, mm -hmm. again, because we've often been volunteers. That's the way we've become mm -hmm. engaged in our community. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's through our schools, with our children. Um, sometimes it's, it's some other motivator. But in any case, because we've been volunteers and we've been on the ground, I think we tend to work um, well with each other. And greetings, everybody, and welcome to Buzz for Good, where we talk all things nonprofit, the people they serve, and the good they do. And so far this February, we have been focusing on Black History Month and some impactful nonprofits that work to preserve the historical legacy and foster social justice for African Americans. March is Women's History Month. And so on today's show, I'm going to feature the work of two women's groups in Southwest Virginia the Roanoke Women's Foundation, and 100 plus women who care New River Valley. Collectively, through what are known as giving circles, these two organizations are arguably having the biggest impact on nonprofits in Roanoke and the New River Valley. One question in particular we discuss is, what is it about women that make them uniquely suited to creating and sustaining these philanthropic organizations. Or, put another way, men, where are you at? I am Michael Hemphill, creator and host of both this radio show and the TV show Buzz that airs Wednesdays on Blue Ridge PBS, where in each episode we feature a nonprofit organization and provide it with a marketing makeover by a member of the American Advertising Federation of Roanoke. And you can watch our show at buzzforgood.com that's buzz, B-U-Z-Z, -Z, number four, good.com. You can also stay connected with us on our socials. That's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube, all at buzz for good. Uh, this Wednesday, February 22nd at 7 p.m. on Blue Ridge PBS, we have a new episode of Buzz that is premiering, uh, featuring not just eight different nonprofits, but also five amazing video producers who generously donate their time and talent, helping nonprofits achieve more buzz. Talent like Ryan Hunt, who shared the mission of the nonprofit Compress and Shock Foundation, or Jamie Neighbors, owner of Boss Motion Picture Company, who helps the United Way of Roanoke Valley spread the word about the importance of COVID vaccinations. Also, Bruce C. Bryan, owner of Five Points Creative, who provided the video buzz for the Virginia Institute of Autism, and who worked with Dan Morelli, who is the videographer for all of our Buzz TV shows, on a separate project featuring local environmental and agricultural project, aka LEAP. And then lastly, Bethany Teague, director of storytelling for the Click and Pledge Foundation, uh, who shared the stories of the Renaissance Music Academy, Blacksburg Volunteer Rescue Squad, the Rescue Mission of Roanoke, and Salem Education Foundation. Uh, this episode will also be available on our YouTube channel at Buzz for Good. I want to thank our sponsors, Freedom First Credit Union, where people bank for good. That's freedomfirst.com, as well as Partners in Financial Planning, a Southwest Virginia-based financial management firm, partnersinfinancialplanning.com. Again, this week I got to visit with two women's funding organizations whose goal is to pool their members' individual gifts so that together they can make a far bigger impact in our communities. At the same time, there are notable differences in how the Roanoke Women's Foundation and 100 Plus Women Who Care of the New River Valley award their funds. And I also explore why women are more successful at building these foundations in my separate conversations with Mary Jean Levin, president of the Roanoke Women's Foundation, and Alexa Casey, a co-founder of 100 Plus Women Who Care in RV. Well, it is my pleasure to welcome here on Buzz for Good, Mary Jean Levin, who is president of the Roanoke Women's Foundation. Welcome. Thank you so much, Michael. And let me begin by thanking you for your commitment to nonprofits in this area. I know how long and how how assiduously you support our nonprofits and you believe, as does Roanoke Women's Foundation, that these are a source of great, great support for our community. 
Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. It's been a joy. Uh, I love nonprofits. I've been involved with them for about 20 years. And what I love about nonprofits is the diversity of missions that uh, they you know, seek to accomplish each and every day. And I know you see that over the course of all the different grant applications that Roanoke Women's Foundation gets every year. It's, it's extraordinary the work that nonprofits do. I completely agree. <laughs> and you know, as I said in my intro, I personally think that there is no more impactful foundation in the Roanoke Valley than the Roanoke Women's Foundation. I mean, the amount of support that you provide each year, $300,000 plus to five to 10 different nonprofits. I mean, it's extraordinary. And so thank you for the work that you have done throughout the years. And your 2023 grant process begins March 1st. So that's correct. Uh, that will, um, from our website, that will be the March 1st will be the opening date for access to the application and it will close on March 31st. And the application process includes a letter of intent uh, from any nonprofit organization in our target area, which is the cities of Roanoke and Salem, the counties of Botetourt, Craig, Franklin, Floyd, and Roanoke. Wonderful. And we'll get to that full process here in a little bit as well. Uh, I wanted to start off, though, because I love how the names of organizations come about, <laughs> right? And so Roanoke Women's Foundation, three words. Roanoke seems fairly self-explanatory. Your service area is Roanoke. And foundation is fairly self-evident as well. I mean, you're obviously providing funds to help a variety of different causes in the community. The women's part, I'm wondering how that came about. Well, it's an interesting question because sometimes we're mistaken for being an organization that only funds projects for women, which yeah. is not the case. Right. I think it would be fair to say that it is largely because of the development of pooled collective giving organizations um, that particularly appealed to women as this became uh, a model for giving uh, and that it fit the way women liked to give. Up to this point, I'd say, oh, for more than 100 years, women have been involved in their communities in supporting nonprofits very much as volunteers, mm -hmm. not so much as funders, having right. a lot of influence on family uh, giving, but not on the large corporate giving. And so this model became something that uh, appealed to women. And someplace in, I'm going to say the late 90s, early aughts, this became something that caught on. Mm -hmm. And there are now a large number of women's collective giving circles across the country. Um, there are other organizations that are also collective giving that are not exclusively women, but that's sort of the way they got off the ground. Mm -hmm. And um, it became something that rather than being something that was the side uh, foundation of a corporation or um, a group of wealthy men. Uh, it was a group of women who were able to do this and saw the pooled giving model as something that they could thoroughly embrace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, talk about the, the history of the Roanoke Women's Foundation in particular and how you came up with the model that you have for organizing and funding. Well, we have two fabulous founders who are still very much engaged with the organization. Uh -huh. um, and their, their story goes back a bit even more before what they started doing. Um, what we sometimes refer to as the mothership of women's giving foundations is the Washington Women's Foundation mm. in Seattle. Okay. Um, that um, began, I believe, around 2000. I'm not sure of their um, uh, founding date. But um, their founder uh, gave presentations on how successful they had been and what they um, were doing in the Seattle and even in the, uh, throughout the state of Washington. And Jenny Jarrett, who is a generous woman in our community and mm -hmm. has been a, a giver in many ways uh, yeah. for a long time, was present at that meeting. 
and um, said, oh, this is a wonderful idea. This would be wonderful in Roanoke. I'm going to go back and see if we can't get something started. And she talked about it with a lot of people, including her very best friend, Candy Elliott. Hmm. And Candy finally said, I'm tired of you talking to me about it. And let's get started. Let's see what we can do. And Hmm. they pulled together a small group of women who were very interested, became the board. And then that group expanded slightly into the original members um the uh that was in 19 i mean excuse me <laughs> 2005 okay 2005 mm-hmm. and that particular year i think they well i can tell you exactly how much money they gave away in that 2005 year was 138,000 dollars wow so they had more than 50 women uh okay. who began that first year um, mm-hmm. Since then, we're now in our 19th year uh, process, uh, but we, in the 18 years of giving, we have given away $4,889,500. Yeah. Bravo, <laughs> bravo, wow. And we've given to 72 organizations. We've given 90 programs or projects. Um, it's It's been a wonderful uh, history. Mm. And the, the organization has generally grown year by year. We have had a couple of setbacks in the 2008 recession sure. in COVID, uh, slight setbacks in in um, in our membership numbers, but our really our ability to give stems from our membership. Well, and let's talk about that real quickly. So how does one become a member of the Ronald Women's Foundation? All you need to do is tell us you want to be. <laughs> well, there is another requirement. <laughs> it's, it's a fairly generous gift sure. of $2,100. Per year. Per year. Yep. Um, but this is a part of a pool, part of a collective. Yeah. And the impact that that gift of any individual, when it's gathered with now almost 200 other women, mm-hmm. is colossal. And that's the appeal of it. Yes. Because these are generally people who have been giving in the community, who are generous about that. But... Um, see that by pooling their money, Mm -hmm. um, they can make an even bigger impact. And it is about impact giving. Right. So uh, I was not a math major, but 200 women times $2,100 a year is over $400,000 in annual giving. Yes. Now, Mm -hmm. now, the original Mm -hmm. model, because originally we started as a um, member of the Community Foundation Serving Western Virginia, that's its current name, and um, the original model was the 2000 was going into gifts and the 100 was going for um, the costs of being a, an organization. And then the community foundation took a small portion out just for management purposes. Right. Uh, but in 2022, we became an independent 501c3. So we mm-hmm. now have our, all of the costs of being an independent organization, um, and but we're still giving two thousand dollars, the two thousand per member every year. That's right. that's our our objective is to see that that's the kind of money that we're giving away. Yeah. So the foundation really only keeps one hundred dollars of every member's twenty one hundred dollars contribution. Yes. And that's just a you know operate as a business. Right. Yeah. Right. And of course we have more expenses now than we have in the past, and we haven't changed our mm-hmm. amount in those intervening years. So that may change in the foreseeable future. Right. Well, slightly. Yeah. I mean, the for some organizations, a $2,000 contribution would be a, would have a tremendous impact. But for a lot of organizations that are in need of, you know, 30, 50, 75, $100,000 of a need, you know, the $2,000 is nice, but being able to get a Roanoke Women's Foundation grant to fund that is such a huge moment for that nonprofit in a given year. So. And our, our commitment is that our minimum gift is $30,000. Right. So um, you have to have a, a $30,000 need. Have, you have to have a need of $30,000. You yeah. have to have some uh, proposal that appropriately would use $30,000. Um, we don't have a maximum stated, um, but we're, we have given grants in the hundred thousand dollar range, mm-hmm. um, I think that's probably a bit of a stopping point, and usually, of course, very effective as well. So. Right, right. But uh, but you you know when you apply, you know if you're mm-hmm. funded, you're going to get a minimum of thirty thousand dollars. 
Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the process. So I know that the application process opens March 1st and nonprofits have until March 31st to submit a letter of intent, which is a a somewhat simple process with a minimum need of $30,000. Correct. And that's, um, I'm trying to think how to best phrase this. Um, It's done in a process that is managed by a a software program, Mm -hmm. um, answering the questions on there. And again, it doesn't open until March 1st, so you can't really study what the questions are until then, although we'd be happy to tell people what the questions are. Um, And they're primarily about need, impact, sustainability. Right. Um, And then that closes on March 31st, and then the Grants Committee of the Women's Foundation looks at all of those applications. We have a typical number of applicants between 50 and 60, roughly, in Mm -hmm. recent years. And we know that we are going to have somewhat limited funds, even though they're generous, uh, it still is a limitation, and that we probably will not be able to make more than six to eight grants. So the first thing that happens with the grants committee is that um, they review all of those, read and review all of those letters of intent and score them. We have a scoring system. Um, it amounts to 100 points. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. And they're divided by questions like need and sustainability and impact, uh, which are the questions on the letter of intent mm-hmm. uh, on the, the process. And um, from that, we then invite a number to make a phase two application that will be a bit more detailed, will contain um, things like budgets and really detailed um, information about the organizations. Mm -hmm. And that's phase two. Uh, So I don't, you want to go on now? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Let me take a quick moment to reintroduce you here. So I'm here joined on Buzz for Good by Mary Jean Levin, who's the president of the Roanoke Women's Foundation. And we are learning about the history of the Roanoke Women's Foundation. Uh, on this day where we're really focusing on women's giving circles throughout uh, our region. And so we were just talking about the letter of intent that's due March 31st. There's a committee that reviews those 50 to 60 different letters of intent from different organizations. And then out of that is maybe what? 20, 15 um, to 20 it's or pro- so? 15 to 20 is probably are, accurate. Or invited I'd to say, phase two. Right, okay. right. I think that's, it It does depend. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, we don't hold ourselves to a specific number because some years it may be a smaller number. And also because organizations apply for differing amounts of money. Yeah. And there are years when everybody wants lots and there are years when really they're applying with smaller expectations mm-hmm. and we say well you know we could do more of these <laughs> because <laughs> and, and and we're we're all in favor of doing more yeah. in fact that's probably one of the most important messages i can convey we want to spend our money yeah. right and that is we want it to go to yeah. effective things that are working in our community mm-hmm. but again we want to spend our money Yes, and you are very successful in, do, in doing that every year. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, more than four hundred thousand or so uh, each year. Well, it's it's around. been so far so far it's been um, between three hundred fifty and four hundred thousand in yeah. recent years, and we're we're working toward. We don't actually we haven't crossed two hundred members quite yet, okay. but uh, we're I think at one hundred ninety four at the moment, wow. and we are very hopeful that this is the year that we're going to go across two hundred. Great. So uh, nonprofits would submit then, who are invited to do so, a phase two application, and then there's a site visit. After Correct. That. All of the all of the organizations that go to phase two <laughs> will have a site visit. They will be visited by a minimum of two members of the grants committee, who are members of the the Women's Foundation. Um, and one of those will be considered the lead visitor. Mm-hmm. So she'll be responsible for um, reporting back to the committee uh, from the site visit, um, being kind of the uh, guardian of the organization through the process. She'll be presenting to the membership the um, results that 
we've come up with at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, that will go back to the whole grants committee, which again will score the, the organizations in phase two in order to select a ballot that will go to the membership. And usually that's mm, seven to ten. Uh, and again, very much dependent on how much money we have available. Sure. So we will know how much money we have um, after our dues are paid, and they're, that's the end of June mm-hmm. <laughs> that they're in. So then we say, okay, now we can do this. Yep. In August, the uh, Grants Committee will hold an open membership meeting at which all members uh, may attend, and um, the reports will come back from all of the, the Phase two organizations uh, the, the site visit leader will present um, a brief summary of the, of the project proposal. And, uh, and then after that meeting, the grants committee will meet again and painfully, painfully <laughs> cut that list a little bit more so that the ballot will be a reasonable number sure. of projects or programs. And then that will go to the membership the beginning of September. And so that final ballot would have six to ten different proposals. And then out of that, the full membership of almost, almost 200 women will vote. And then the it, it ranges, but what, five to seven or eight different proposals exactly. will be accepted exactly. and, and receive the exactly. Roanoke Women's Foundation grant. Exactly. Now, okay. of course, early on, we had a number of years when it was two or three or maybe four grants. Right. Now it's more, and, and that's another reason yeah. why we want more members, <laughs> because the more members we have, the more capability we have sure. to, to carry this through. Right, right. Well, uh, full disclosure, I am very familiar with this process, <laughs> having applied actually the last three years uh, for grant funding for the American Advertising Federation of Rota, which is my partner in producing our Buzz episodes. Um the first year was the very first year we started the TV show, and so uh, we did not make it to phase two, understandably, because we were still kind of a, a startup, and quite honestly, I probably wasn't really sure what we were doing that year either. <laughs> the last two years, we've been very fortunate to get to the final ballot, and um, so yeah, I, but you know, and while sure there was some disappointment in not receiving a grant, when you look at those organizations that did receive grants, I mean, my stars, how do you... Uh, argue with, you know, an organization that's helping the homeless or an organization that is trying to provide um, artistic opportunities for low-income children. I mean, on and on and on. There are just so many wonderful causes that Roanoke Women's Foundation supports every year. Is there one in particular over your time with the foundation that particularly resonates with you? Well, there are there interesting things. First of all, I was on the grants committee for six years before I became vice president of the Mm. organization so during that period and and three of them were in the leadership of the of the grants committee so naturally i saw a lot of them in 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 as we almost all do fell in love with with many of them Uh, but interestingly enough um the beginning of this year um i asked as part of our um, board retreat the board to mentioned if they had one or two that they particularly loved. And there were several that really rose to the top. Mm. Um, the uh, Roanoke Refugee Resettlement uh, Project okay. uh, that's uh, managed by Commonwealth the Catholic Charities was one that people uh, found especially um Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, what the, was the funding for? Do you uh, it was actually for empowering refugee women as they were learning to adjust to American society. Many of them have come from societies where women are not as highly valued Mm. or they are uh, valued in the home but not beyond that. And yet many of these women have, um, of necessity, gone in or wanted to go into work to help their families financially. And uh, this this program was um, assisting them in that process and assisting them in helping their children to adjust to American society as well. Oh, okay. Um, one that I happen to have been the lead visitor on that I did not even know existed mm-hmm. was CERCAP, which is the Southeast Regional Community Assistance Project. Yeah. CERCAP is headquartered in Roanoke, but it is an organization that covers multi-states in the Southeast. They are an agency that um, helps in being sure that 
American households have water and plumbing. Quite frankly, that's what it comes down to. I mean, you, wow. we are, we, surprisingly yeah. enough, yeah, there it, are many families yeah. and there are many households that don't have this. It's sad we need a nonprofit to ensure it, that. It, it is. Wow. Ultimately, the funding that we provided was used in Craig County, okay. uh, which is the poorest area of our service area. Right. And right. Um, we, were, we were thrilled to be able to do that. Wonderful. But it's a wonderful project, and people loved it. Um, mm-hmm. And, and it certainly have been others. I mean, there are some that are so much fun that, that we've done wonderful programs to help um, children's after school, especially middle school. Um, mm-hmm. After school programs, because that's an area where children fall into uh, um, a gap between having after school child care and being quite old enough to be on their own yep. and yet needing help with homework, right. uh, safety. Um, and so we've done a, a good deal with that. And there's some wonderful after school programs that we've, we've several that we've we've funded over the years. And we featured on our TV show, Buzz, uh, the West End Center, the West. Boys and Girls Clubs of Southwest yes. Virginia. Both they, of which we have know, funded right? at times. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. Great organizations. Yeah. Right, right, the exactly. community youth program at St. John's, yep. um, the um, cafe program. That's a really interesting one where they use... Um, training children in steel drum playing as Mm. a special focus of um, building teams. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, I mean, there are just some some wonderful things out there. Um, Kids Soar is another one with a little Mm -hmm. bit younger um, population. But those are all ones that we've we've funded over the years. Yeah, yeah. You know, having, again, you're talking about the process of, you know, going through your, you know, applications and awarding grants. It is such a collaborative I might say you know democratic process it is definitely everyone is involved with it you're really trying to seek consensus amongst all of the members and I'm wondering you know are those that collaboration consensus building democratic values are those more hallmarks of uh, a women's group women's leadership I hate to say yes, but in a, in a sense, I think it is. I think women are, are very used to working collaboratively. Mm-hmm. Again, because we've often been volunteers, that's the way we've become mm. engaged in our community. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's through our schools, with our children. Um, sometimes it's, it's some other motivator. But in any case, because we've been volunteers and we've been on the ground, I think we tend to work um, well with each other and uh, appreciate that. And then the other wonderful thing about this is that this organization is made up of so many women who have been engaged with nonprofits in our community. They come in with so much knowledge. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we see on the grants committee is that we have people there who know one area of nonprofits or two or three specific organizations and can add some texture to the non- mm. to what we're looking mm-hmm. at, um, it's and and we do have, of course, not not a terribly limited focus, but we do have focus. Uh, we we basically have four areas of impact that we want to make: arts and culture, education, the environment, and health and human services. And of course, it's very difficult not to know that health and human services is going to often rise to the top as yeah. it particularly did in 2020 for right. example sure. and we and we have the flexibility that we can choose to do that we really try very hard originally it was very difficult to fund across all of those topic areas it's become easier as we have more grants and more possibilities mm-hmm. but um, those are our areas of impact um, and along with our geographic impact, very important. And that I want to go back to the geographic impact because it's, it seems perhaps somewhat limiting, but it means that our members who are, I would call, um, educated generalists hmm. have real opportunity to know the organizations, to know where needs are in our community. Um, there, It's not a question. There aren't wonderful needs that we would love to help in other places, but, but this particular organization focuses on our local community, and we really want to be as available 
to our local nonprofits because of that, because we really know that, that a lot of our problems start at home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautifully put. Well, one more time, I'm here with Mary Jean Levin, who is president of the Roanoke Women's Foundation, who has just uh, elucidated the reasons why the Roanoke Women's Foundation is so successful, because it's basically run by women. Uh, <laughs> well, you're very kind. Well, I, 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 I know the, there are wonderful women in this organization, yeah. and they would appreciate that, but mm-hmm. we are... We are uh, um, uh, gender equal in terms of our appreciation of people in our community. Uh, understood, but I mean, having been a part of various organizations, I, I would say that you know, when it comes to collaboration and consensus building, and you know, again, democratic values, it, um, it, a Roanoke Men's Foundation, I could see becoming very ego driven <laughs> and and undemocratic. I mean, sadly. Uh, so I, and I say that being the father of three daughters, you know, these are, you know, these are, you know values that I want them to develop yeah. more of. So anyway, so I just applaud all the work that the Roanoke Women's Foundation does. And um, I hope that you have a wonderful and successful year uh, ahead with wonderful grant opportunities that come before you and, um, you know, that, that you eclipse that 200 member number so that you can hit that $400,000 mark this year. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm, I'm certainly hoping so as well. But what we will for sure meet this year is over $5 million donated in the wow. community. Wow. Because we're so close to it now that, yeah. uh, that, that there's no question that we're not going to do that this year. Yeah, so 19 years, $5 million. Mm. Uh, again, there's no more impactful funding organization in the Roanoke Valley than the Roanoke Women's Foundation. And, and you know, another part of it, Michael, mm-hmm. is that... Um, we often, our gift often proves to leverage other gifts. Right. Um, the community, because again, it's local, the community knows who we are, knows what we do, knows a little bit about our process, although it's complicated enough that everybody doesn't know it in detail, and I hope I've been able to illuminate a little bit yeah. of that. Um, but the, they know that the process is seriously undertaken. And so when we give a substantial grant to an organization, they have something that they can take to somebody else and say, well, you know, we got a women's foundation grant. Yeah. We still need an additional amount to make this happen. Mm-hmm. But here we are with this. Yeah. Or we have this other need that we want to be right. fulfilled. And, and it, it definitely gives credibility to the organization Absolutely. and to the project or program that, yep. that they're fund that we're funding. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's a value we, we cherish as well. Right. And, and any nonprofit should cherish as well. Yes, it's the funding that's needed, but being able to hold up that stamp of approval from the Rona Women's Foundation is huge, huge. So thank you. Well, we certainly hope so. And the thing we keep telling our organizations is when you've made it to phase two, there is not a bad organization mm, in there. There right. is nothing in there that wouldn't be a wonderful asset yeah. for our community. Having made it to phase two twice, I would <laughs> like to <laughs> concur with well, that. Well, you take credit for that, Michael. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. We really feel that. And, yeah. and, it's, and it's often painful mm-hmm. uh, to, to make our individual votes. Um, counting those, trying to weigh one against another is just so hard to do yeah, right. and and it's it's hard sometimes for us to know exactly what other members have been motivated by but mm-hmm. we know that they're good we know that there are good organizations that need us we want things that are make it will make a difference we want to see our money. We don't fund endowments. We don't fund long term. We want usually to have our money used within a year or two. And um, but we're try to be very generous when people come up against problems that mean that that something can't be accomplished in that two year period. So that we do ask organizations to come back to us to explain and you know. But it takes probably two sentences to explain it, and we'll say, <laughs> "Yep, that's." absolutely same kind of thing we wanted you to do and you were trying to do and we we understand why it's been delayed so we we really do try to be flexible we really want to be partners Mm -hmm. with the organizations we don't want to be we're not we're not looking to design the projects for them we know that they're so good at doing that but we love to work with them in partnership and we love also 
seeing sometimes where multiple organizations are trying to address the same thing and mm -hmm. we sometimes are able to connect them with each other and say, you know, this organization is also working on this but from a slightly different angle and maybe you should get together a little more. And yep. That's not as though we're we're not we're not the experts. That's again what I would say, educated generalists. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mary Jean Levin, uh, president of Roanoke Women's Foundation, thanks so much. Thank you, Michael. This was a wonderful opportunity. The Roanoke Women's Foundation is hosting an informational session on Thursday, February 23rd at 5.30 p.m. at St. John's Episcopal Church in Roanoke for all nonprofits that are interested in applying for grant funding this year. More at roanokewomensfoundation.org. Speaking of websites, stay connected with Buzz throughout the week. On our website, buzzforgood.com, that's buzz, B-U-Z-Z, -Z, number four, good.com, as well as our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and TikTok, all at Buzz for Good. Now, from the Roanoke Valley to the New River Valley, we continue our exploration of women who care by featuring my conversation with Alexa Casey, co-founder of 100 Plus Women Who Care, New River Valley. It is my honor to welcome to Buzz for Good, Alexa Casey, who is a founding member of 100 Plus Women Who Care, New River Valley. Alexa, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate being here. Well, let me thank you because your organization was very generous in being an underwriting sponsor of an upcoming episode of Buzz, our TV show that we are going to feature literacy volunteers of the new river valley and we are so excited about this opportunity to work with a great organization which would not have been possible without your organization so thanks so much oh for sure yeah that was exciting definitely yeah. exciting so it always is <laughs> so <laughs> well uh, let's let's rewind in time a little bit for those who do not know about 100 plus women who care new river valley the name kind of implies uh, you know, what your organization does, but why don't you share it with us? Well, uh, it is an organization that is uh, mostly in the United States, but it is basically there. You can find different international sites. Uh, and I discovered it. Uh, I went um, in, I was in Ohio and I stopped by a friend's house and she had just returned from, from a hundred plus women who care meeting. And she told me about it and I thought, wow, that makes so much sense. And so, um, Basically, what it is, is that you have uh, women and you're trying to get 100 plus women um, who all commit to donating $100 each quarter. And uh, when they donate those um, that $100 each quarter, uh, there are three different groups that will present three different nonprofits in the area. And uh, after a five minute presentation, uh, the women will then hear, uh, will, will be able to ask questions of each organization and then after that uh, Q&A is over with then the women uh, vote and then um, whoever gets the most votes basically wins the entire prize so the, each hundred dollars from each women will go to that one organization and uh, it's it's a it all happens in an in an hour or two so it's a it's a wow. kind of that's yeah, so we've been doing that since since the beginning. So okay, and and when was the beginning? So we had a um, the the very very beginning was back in about 2014, and at that time, after our, I was visiting my friend in Yellow, she was in Yellow Springs, Ohio. I came back, and uh, another friend of mine, Beth Parker, who was also a founder, I told her about the idea, and she really she really liked the idea so both of us started um, to work on it and we managed to have um, about three three different places that we donated to but one of the things that uh, we were having trouble with was getting enough women uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so and we were trying to adjust uh, guidelines because in, in most of the groups it's a hundred dollars uh, per woman and I thought, well, maybe maybe we adjust it and change it to 25, 50. So anyway, we, we tried to um, kind of kind of hack the system, thinking that something we could do to make it 
make it work. Sure. Uh, but none of none of that worked. So then Sarah came to town, and Sarah Black uh, was um, the other co-founder. She was involved in another group also in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. Um, they had t uh, 220 women, and in running that organization, they kept a pretty tight ship in terms of how to how to design it. There wasn't a lot of tweaking, uh, shifting. It was pretty much each woman for each quarter donates um, $100. You make a two-year commitment to being part of the group, uh, and so that's whoever the group votes for, that's where you um, send your money to. So mm -hmm. after Sarah joined, then we um, we basically, that's when things got going, because there definitely needs to be um, a very strict um, kind of structure to it, yeah. which made made all the difference. So that so our first one with Sarah was the Children's Museum of Blacksburg, which is now mm. the Wonder Universe, and yep. that was back in April 2016. Yeah, so the, the idea is you get a, at least 100 women who each agreed mm -hmm. to donate $100 per quarter, so four times a year, $400, and out of that, if my math skills are correct, the goal is to award four ten thousand dollar grants over the course of a year. Right, each year. So mm, lovely, mm -hmm. lovely. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you this: Why women? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, again, um, it was I ran into my friend who was, you know, that was that's the group that she was involved in. I checked it out. Uh, it's, I think the group actually started in Michigan, and then uh, that's kind of just followed suit with that. So mm -hmm. um, I don't, I can't say that I know why just women. Uh, we did at one point uh, have some men that were really interested and um, wanted, you know, were interested, but, and we're looking at starting their own. Uh, and that's, they kind of sat in on some of the sessions that we had. Uh, and I think they tried, but it didn't, it never really got going. Mm. Um, so, but I don't know that we would have um, turned away men to be part of it, but it just it never, it never happened. We didn't, I don't know that we got anyone to say, hey, could I join your group? Um, right. that, that, that just didn't happen. So the, the name kind of implies that it's for women only. <laughs> <laughs> right. No one, no one's like, that's good. I don't want to yeah. be part of that. Well, but I mean, they did what, try. They, they, they yeah. made a valiant effort to try to do a hundred, a hundred plus men who care. Mm -hmm. But I think they only got to about 15, if I remember, if I recall. Well, I wonder, I mean, what is it about the fact that it's a group of women that makes this work, whereas obviously 100 plus men who care didn't work? It's... Hmm. Well, I think, I, 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 you know, I, I think that there's the importance of a sense of community and and working together and the importance of that uh, i think there's there's a lot of um kind of fellowship with uh the women and the importance of um kind of figuring out ways to work as a team uh so i think that's that for me that seems to be what really works mm -hmm. and it's also very um I, I find it to be very clear cut uh, and just a little bit of effort makes a big difference. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of, I think there's a lot of people attracted to that. Yeah. Um, the meetings are always, um, you know, we had to, with COVID, we had to switch to online. We, we missed one meeting where we didn't have it at all, but then the next time we were supposed to meet, we ended up setting up Zoom. And so we met for Zoom for quite a bit. Now, since, um, you know, we started that, we are we actually doing both. So our meetings were incorporated in the Zoom along with the live, a live meeting. Yeah. So. Well, I was, mm -hmm. I know from, from my experience being, you know, there with y'all, I mean, it was such a congenial, collaborative, uh, you know, space where, you know, everyone, yeah. everyone's voice was heard. Everyone, you know, really wanted a consensus building. Everyone had a voice. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I, and I'm as having worked for women and with women and being the father of three women, um, see those as being more, uh, I guess, women oriented traits and characteristics and values, which I think men could certainly learn from, um, you know, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I had some, I have some 
close male friends and I, I ask them about, you know, hey, would you ever consider doing something like this? And they're like, no way, I would never do that. And, I, mm. and they would never, never really able to tell me why they wouldn't, you yeah. know, they wouldn't kind of, they would imagine themselves doing something like that. Um, but uh, they just, I, I, I yeah. I, just, I, think I found some, that interesting. Yeah, I think there's there's more ego involved with a group of men. Mm -hmm. I think there's more of a, you know, kind of a, a chain of command where there's it's mm -hmm. not it's not all, you know, uh, democratic. It's you know, there someone wants to be in charge, and you you know the whole alphas yeah. and, and all that. Just mm -hmm. I don't know. It is it's it's not as collaborative kind of an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that might, that might have been it, and yeah. it was. No. I know it was. Yeah, that might have been it, but it it's definitely um, a very. It, it's it's a very um, strong community. Indeed, indeed. Well, once again, here on Bus for Good, I'm joined by Alexa Casey, who is a founding, a founder of 100 Plus Women Who Care New River Valley, a, a giving circle comprised of women. Uh, who every year, four times a year, will donate $100 towards a nonprofit so that that deserving nonprofit, through a competition of sorts, will receive $10,000 uh, four times a year. So, um, And Buzz for Good was fortunate in partnership with the American Advertising Federation of Roanoke to recently be one of those recipients, and we're going to use that to produce an episode on the literacy volunteers of the New River Valley. Uh, describe and that was your first and that was I'm sorry that was your first time out too now it there's was, a lot yeah. of groups there's a lot of groups that have to come multiple times before well, now, one before they even get chosen right so, yeah well and that's um, what I want to talk about um, next is you know describe the process of how it works for a group to get considered and then chosen so first of all, um, you know, before you get out of the gate, it has to be a nonprofit, a registered nonprofit. So that that is um, is 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 absolutely necessary. We also are looking at any work that's done in the New River Valley. Um, so any any um, so any kind of let's say even um, so uh, for some of those larger organizations like Big Brothers Big Sisters, if they came um, and they weren't able to show that they were going to actually have a project, that the monies themselves were going to be used for a project in uh, the New River Valley, then we wouldn't be, they would not be um, someone that we would, uh, that would even be a participant in it. Right. Um, we also look at um, groups that have presented before um, and groups that have not presented before. So you notice that we had two, we have generally have two buckets. So the one bucket is um, groups that have never been presented, never presented, and then ones that have, but um, maybe they haven't um, received it. Um, then when, once we pick three, we pick um, basically um, two from the um, new folks and then one from the older folks that have already presented. Mm -hmm. And then um, whatever order they're, they're picked, that's who starts and does the presentation. They have five minutes to do their presentation. Uh, and then we hear all of the five minutes, we hear from all the organizations. And then after that, we share more about the organizations themselves. So there's a lot of questions that come up. Now, that yes. particular <laughs> night, there weren't that many, but there are some times where there's a lot of questions and a lot of details. Um, so, uh, and then the women will ask questions. We let that go as long as it needs to go. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that we want to make sure that people have all their questions answered. The good thing about that too is that um, you you don't have to be um, the member. Um, and let me back up. Another important thing is that you have to be a member. So you have to be someone who is a contributing member um, right. to be able to bring bring the nonprofit um, into the into our system. Yeah, so I, it's could, not I just, couldn't just apply. Yeah. I had to you know, find someone who was actually a member of the mm -hmm. organization. And, uh, you know, we were very fortunate because we um, had a relationship with uh, Debbie Sherman Lee who is a member of your organization because she's also mm -hmm. uh, on the board of the Christiansburg Institute. And we had right. produced, produced a buzz episode on the Christiansburg Institute back in 2021. And um, thankfully she believes so strongly in what we did that she was willing to nominate us in front of your group. But even then, uh, you know, I, I wasn't allowed to speak. She was the one who had to speak on our behalf, which I think goes to 
the need for your members to feel passionate about a particular cause. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that's the that's the challenge. So even if you knew somebody and they didn't know really what you were doing, um, how you speak about it, how you share on it is 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 important. The story, as as you know, Michael, the story is 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 important. Yeah. And uh, as a person presents and shares their excitement about, um, you know, what's happening, that's that that makes all the difference. So. Well, mm -hmm. uh, again, joined here on Buzz for Good by Alexa Casey, founding member of 100 Plus Women Who Care New River Valley, a giving circle. And, you know, looking back over your time uh, with the organization, has there been a particular highlight or two for you personally? Oh, yeah, there's been plenty, but I'll try to um, kind of focus on, um, you know, a couple of them. Uh, Valley Interface Child Care was one, um, and that was one. She she came multiple times, and she finally was able, you know, able to get it. But that was one that was, you know, just a fun, fun one. Mm -hmm. um, we also had um, um, the Woodchucks, um, which I don't know if you're familiar with them or no, not, but the, not. it's or okay. So it's an organization here that basically. Um, they get firewood for people that are in need and they needed a new truck. So there was inmate family assistance of the NRV. I think yeah. they came, it was their first time and they got it like the first time. So mm -hmm. another exciting one was the uh, beans and rice. I, I, you know, you hate to kind of identify some of them because they're, they're all, you know, it was, it was all great recipients, but um, beans and rice, they have a mobile food truck. And so that helped, you know, with some of their um, work with that too. So, um, and what's nice too, is that we have the organizations come back and, and tell us more about their project and what's happening. So while we're actually counting the votes and trying to get a sense of kind of where things are at, then we, um, we get to hear from the others and, um, kind of and, and what they're up to so mm -hmm. don't you just love nonprofits? Um, i mean yeah the, the, yeah the, just mm -hmm. in the course of your last you know two minutes of talking you know you mentioned uh beans and rice you mentioned valley interfaith child care woodchuck mm -hmm. wonder universe right i mean mm -hmm. completely different missions each of them and yet right. they're all bound by this you know nonprofit umbrella that is mm -hmm. who, whose sole missions are to enhance the quality of life in so many areas uh, of where we live. It's just, it's mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, yeah, they, definitely. They, yeah, and, and they would not be able to exist without the support of organizations like 100 Plus Women Who Care New River Valley. So thank mm -hmm. you for mm -hmm. making that happen. For anyone who wants to find out more about your organization and perhaps starting a giving circle similar to that in their community, uh, what would they need to do? Well, we have a, a website, so it's 100, um, 100 uh, women who care nrv.com. So 100 okay. women who care nrv.com. Mm -hmm. And we have everything about, we have listed all the recipients. We also have uh, when our next meeting is. And, uh, you know, if you want to t-shirt um you know all of that and gives a little bit more about each donation you can certainly sign up there and uh, find out you know how to get in touch with us uh, my phone our phone numbers are on there and our information's on there um and there's also forms we we ask people to fill out a commitment form um you know if you're going to join us uh if you're if you're an organization uh we also have forms on there to give us a little bit more information about you know what what you what your organization does and again um you you would have to be a member as well um so we don't like like you said earlier we don't we don't just accept right. organizations unless you're a member. So, yeah. um, but I, I highly recommend it. It makes sense. I think everyone uh, that that's part of our group feels very, um, it, it feels like it makes a difference. Like they, if yeah. they gave a hundred dollars to an organization, it's, it's a very different feeling than when you give it with a whole group of women mm -hmm. so you're not giving just your hundred you're giving ten thousand dollars to an organization and that that feels um 
that feels very special and very um, just very meaningful. So we are always um, looking for anyone to, to be a part of our group. And, uh, and, and again, what I'm amazed by, and you, you kind of referenced it, there's so many different groups out there. And mm -hmm. I'm always surprised after you think you know all of them, there's still more that you haven't heard of before. Yeah. Um, so that's what I love about this too. The other thing that's, I think one more thing, and I could keep, yeah. obviously you can tell, I can keep talking about this, <laughs> that, um, that the women, they're moved by all of the stories. Uh, sometimes it's super difficult to know, oh my gosh, I want to vote for all of them. But obviously at the end of the end of the time, th there's only one that can win. We did have a tie once and we did end up splitting it because we had a tie. Mm. Wow. Um, but generally, generally, and that worked out fine. They were, they were fine with it because they were both um, dealing with uh, senior care and they both felt that each organization, you know, th th they were, they, they just managed to, to kind of work it out that way. So, um, but generally there's only one winner, but what I've seen a lot of women do is they'll still give money to some of the other organizations that show up. The mm -hmm. individuals will just want to still give to the organizations that did not um, get chosen. So that's always very heartwarming as well. So, yeah. well, I think it speaks to the name of your organization, women who care. And regardless, mm -hmm. regardless of the number, that's, what is needed most in creating a, a giving circle like this is you, you just got to mm -hmm. care. And if you do, then everything else is just logistics. Then you can figure that right. out. So, right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. So, but it's, it's, um, it, 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 we're, we're making a difference. Uh, we have been around, you know, since 2014, uh, we're, we're, and that's, you know, and I'll say 2016, the, the official, when it actually started working. <laughs> um, and, uh, so we're, we're just, um, really proud of the work that we're doing and we look you know, forward to doing more. Well, as a beneficiary of 100 plus women who care NRB, as well as just someone who, uh, is obviously, you know, concerned about the state of nonprofits in our community. I want to thank you for all the work that you guys are doing. And um, again, uh, pleasure to have Alexa Casey here on Buzz for Good talking about 100 plus women who care in New River Valley. Thanks so much. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate you um, interviewing me and, and learning more about it. I, I appreciate the time. Many thanks again to 100 Plus Women Who Care New River Valley for its recent grant to the American Advertising Federation of Roanoke, which will underwrite production costs of our new Buzz TV show featuring literacy volunteers of the New River Valley. Many thanks also to the Roanoke Women's Foundation for its nearly $400,000 each year in support of so many worthwhile nonprofit causes. So whether you are a woman, or a man and men we've got a lot of catching up to do we hope that you take a moment this week to be a buzz for good in your community and we will see you back here next time on buzz for good <laughs>